Hello and welcome back to the end of the week podcast and we've got in store for you today a bit of a, a, a global narrative that is really the main topic of choice which is that of interest rates and interest rate cuts being pushed back and that comes after US CPI came out earlier this week and it comes on the coattails of the strong labor report we had <clears throat> the week prior so we'll talk about that and then that will add a nice kind of uh, sequence into talking about the FTSE 100, who, believe it or not, it's actually trading. If it can, if it can maintain where it is at the moment, <laughs> it could don't jinx it. Could possibly don't jinx it. Could possibly see a record high for the FTSE 100, which might see on the FTSE. Yeah, if you don't follow markets, you might be thinking. Well, I thought I read the news and everyone tells us how terrible London is and the IPO market's dying and all these things. And here we go. The FTSE's ripping today. So we'll look to explain why exactly that is happening. Uh, and then we've had some of the first of the big earnings. And it's always the same. The big banks kick off earnings season. And so we'll look very top level to cover JP Morgan, who are actually down about 3%. According to this ahead of opening bell on Friday, a uh, particular focus on their net interest income missing estimates. On the flip side, BlackRock are up 3%. So a good 6% swing in pre-market between the two. And they now have assets under management of $10.5 trillion. <laughs> That's a T. That's team. right. <laughs> yeah, that, that, I said trillion, not billion, uh, just to be crystal clear there. Um, so we'll also look at some of those those numbers as well. But uh, before I begin the show, Piers, I uh, I did get spotted on uh, Sunday, oh, yeah. London Bridge. Yeah. Um, there was a guy who Talk was uh, looking at me a little bit funny. And I was, I was like, okay, <laughs> what is this? It's about to kick off here. I better, better, better hold on to my phone in my pocket. Um, and then he kind of clocked me two or three times and then he stopped me and he said, um, sorry, do you, do you do a podcast? Uh, <laughs> and I was kind of like, uh, in my head for one second, I thought of saying, no, yeah, but he looked like a very sensible guy. Um, so I, I, I said, yes. And he said, yeah, he listens to, he listens to this podcast. Uh, every episode and he said it helped him land his role he currently has been working for a few years i think he said at macquarie and esg right um a cambridge lse grad yeah so, yeah he said that this made the difference so yeah max Gunella, if you're listening to this episode thanks for uh stopping me and saying hi but it did get me thinking which was you know it is quite strange when someone does actually give you feedback because you and I have these little uh, Zoom chats yeah. and it's just you and I talking. It's basically, it's basically a little bubble that, that, <laughs> yeah. we, that we we exist in. Yeah. yeah. You do forget that, you know, the, I mean, obviously with the purpose of what we're trying to do here is to educate and and make it interesting. And, and you know, that is one thing that Max said. He said it's actually, you know, hats off for trying to make it different from normal dry financial media. And so... So that's what we're shooting for. And and yeah, one of the things I, I kind of looked at was, well, if it helped him, and I've had a few others at the spring weeks come up to me and say it's helped them. So it seems to work. And the, the main thing here is that the best way to to help more people from our perspective is really on you, the listeners, to share it yeah. uh, and to share it far and wide. The easiest way uh, is probably just get, like the share button on the podcast platform and then just drop it in WhatsApp uh, to anyone that you think would benefit. If you're in a society, if you're in a wider kind of application group, because I know there's a few different ones uh, and just get it out there and, you know, let's, let's help each other. Yeah. I mean, the more, yeah, exactly. I mean, the more, I guess the more listeners, the bigger this can become, then the more time and uh, investment we can put into making it, bigger and better right so yeah. yeah so yeah call to arms there you're right i i get a lot of uh questions over you know how much time should you spend on doing this sort of thing um you know because we're we, we create simulations that's <laughs> what we do and we run that type of assessment and training the podcast is kind of the bolt-on 
which really was a little bit of a um, something that I just wanted to try during COVID. Yeah. And it's just kind of manifested into what it is today. But yeah, if you want, if you find it useful and you want us to like ensure that the quality stays as high as we can possibly make it, then yeah, please do rate the podcast. If you've never done that before, even better, drop a review because the review yeah. is what really then powers the algorithms on these podcast platforms to spread it. Uh, that's if I could ask one thing of you this weekend or whenever you listen to this, uh, that's my request. So yeah, enough of the, uh, the plug <laughs> let's uh let's dive straight in then and let's talk about the us cpi report because that was that was quite a big market mover if you're looking at the intraday yeah um so yeah talk me through it yeah well um it came in hot i mean again so this is the third report of the year so we had the march inflation figures announced this was on wednesday afternoon um but the february and the january ones they were also hot what do we mean by hot? It's that they're higher than expected. Yeah, I was going to say, I was going to ask you, what is your definition of hot? Because <laughs> I saw lots of people saying hot. And I looked at the numbers and I was like, is that hot? I don't that, think, hot. That, that doesn't look hot to me. I call it, it like higher than expected. It's tepid. It's more like oven ready rather than hot. Yeah, but the point is it's... <laughs> It's not cold, right? It's not on the cold side of the fence. It's on the hot side of the fence just. Yeah, um, I think it's a little bit, it's a little bit much to call it hot, but yeah. Well, look, let's put some figures on this, okay? So the headline year-on-year -year inflation was 3.5%, okay? Uh, and that was higher than expected. And it was, it was higher than the previous month. In February, it was 3.2. So it's gone up from 3.2 to 3.5. Um, and that's the wrong way because we need it to be coming down. Uh, and that's the highest figure we've had since August and September last year. So back end of last summer, it was at 3.7%. But the point, I guess, is, yeah, it's gone up now a couple of months in a row. But really, I guess, stepping, zooming out, the point is it's not going down. And we've been flat. This, this I guess, inflation thing has been at best, sideways for a year. And if you're looking shorter term, if you're looking at the three-month averages, because looking at one month in, our, in isolation on its own, it's too short term to really draw any proper sort of conclusions about extrapolating this out for the rest of the year kind of thing, right? But if you often your people will say, well, look, you need three, kind of need three months of data to really draw any conclusions. Well, if you look at the three-month averages now, then the three-month average is going up. All of them are going up, the headline and the core. Um, and so the point is the Fed are not getting what they need to start cutting rates. They need the inflation levels to drop, to carry on going down, and therefore drop below three, head towards two and a half, head towards two. And so that hasn't happened. And when you feed in all the other data points, as you mentioned, really strong job numbers um, announced at the back end of last week, we had some really hot, you know, amazing ISM manufacturing figures. Um, and, and so the labor market's still super strong and inflation's edging back up. And so, yeah, the probabilities of rate cuts, like June now, forget it. I mean, and you only go back a few weeks, right? And we, it was still June was a more probable than not that we'd get a rate cut. Well, forget June, forget July. It's now actually most probable there's no cut in July either. And so you're starting to think, well, okay, then we're kind of deep into Q3 here then before we maybe get the first cut. Um, and so people have really now said, forget three cuts uh, and you're really looking at two cuts at best in 2024. That's the news. Two cuts at best. And the way things are going, I mean, look at the data and the trends. You're not going to get any cuts at this, as far as it stands. I mean, yeah, so, it's a genuine likelihood. Yeah. So the market, as you said, is pricing in SEP at the moment. And obviously this this... This thing has been moving fast as far yeah. as expectations are concerned. So I wouldn't put too much 
into that at the moment. US strategists at Deutsche Bank and Bank of America, they've updated this week and they now predict the Fed will ease policy just once this year. So they're already down to one now. Um, and that is, the consensus is still two. Some are starting to break away to one. Uh, and with the timing of that, they're looking at December from, a, from Deutsche Bank's perspective. Yeah, I think there's a certain amount of human psychology here because we've spent the last 12 months or maybe not, yeah, maybe like well, not quite 12 months. That's certainly six months, right? We've we spent going, right, the Fed are going to cut, the Fed are going to cut, the Fed are going to cut. And as each month goes by, we're going, oh, all right, maybe they're going to cut less. Oh, no, they're going to cut even less. Oh, no, they're probably going to cut even less now. And actually, I think it's because we thought they were going to cut before that we're now still, this confirmation bias is that we still think they're going to cut. If you remove all of your historical memory and just looked at the data, there's no cut in the data, right? Inflation's flat, above 3%, super tight labor market. Now, if you just looked at that with no historical bias, you put a higher probability on a hike than a cut. But was that baggage of us desperately wanting those cuts kind of is still weighing on people's mindset and therefore their analysis. So, so at the moment then, stocks, as I said, they, they did react at the time of the release. But if you look at the chart now, two days later, we've effectively reversed and we're completely flat prior yeah. we're pretty much trading it prior yeah. the cpi numbers however what's the story in fx and in right rates? so you're right the the stock market reaction as of yet hasn't been particularly meaningful that could be i mean if you look at that that's if you're looking at an index level right and the thing about these s p 500 indices you know the big tech stocks they're very they're the ones that are most immune to rates high for longer because they're not borrowing any money. They've got just loads of cash. So they're more immune to that. But so actually the big moves, it's, I'd say the FX markets have really stolen the show here in terms of the reactions we've seen. And this is a double whammy, right? Because whilst we're pushing out our timing on the when the Fed is going to cut, the timing is not being pushed out on, for example, when the ECB might cut. So now, this is what we call interest rate differential, right? When you're thinking about interest rates in the US versus Europe, now we're thinking a summer cut in the ECB. And so the euro has, has devalued quite dramatically against the dollar um, off the bat, you know, this week. And actually we're trading down at the lowest we've seen since kind of November. And, you know, generally... You might expect to see a breakout. There's a really key level around 105 um, on euro dollar. And if that's the 2023 low set in October and the way we're shaping up here, we might get a test of that and maybe even a break. And that could be pretty significant, a break of 105 because the euro has only really ever been down around, well, below 105 really once. And that was right in the middle of COVID. So that this is very, very you know, historically low levels. It's also, but this is dollar strength that's driving this versus that euro. It's the same for the pound. So the pound is devaluing against the dollar as well, or to put a better way around, the dollar is appreciating. So the biggest reaction we can see here is dollar strength off the back of us pushing even further out the idea that the Fed might cut. Um, this year. And so the pound versus the dollars down has broken below the 125 handle. Uh, and that's the first time we've been below there for uh, like six months. Um, and so, yeah, dollar strength is the kind of um, big theme here. So so following this through then, and, and having talked a little bit about the pound there. So let's talk about the FTSE 100. Yeah. And tie in then, first of all, how does the FX side play into something like the FTSE? Well, so you've got to look at the composition of the the index, right? And so 
when you look at the FTSE 100, it's 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 a, it's full of mega sort of mega cap international businesses that are miners like the likes of like Anglo American, for example, Rio Tinto. You got the big energy. Uh, firms like Royal Dutch Shell and BP, for example. And the thing about those companies, the, the products they mine get sold in dollars and their revenues are generated globally, right? So if the pound is devaluing against the dollar and you're a UK domicile business basically selling your products in dollars, well, then when you repatriate the dollar revenue, you're not getting more pounds, because of the FX move. And so when the when sterling drops in value, this is like this is perfect for the FTSE 100 mega cap global firms because their sterling revenues and sterling profits move higher as a result. So what you're seeing as this FX move happens, you're getting a big boost to the upside on the FTSE. And what's really significant for the FTSE 100, finally Finally, 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 we're above 8,000. Um, and I don't want to jinx it. We did go above 8,000 very briefly on the 2nd of April, intraday, didn't close above eight. It does look like now we are up above eight and we are, you know, we, we've had, uh, actually, we haven't had a close above eight. Sorry, I thought we might have done yesterday, but we didn't. So, yeah, we're, going to, we're hoping for a close above 8,000 in the FTSE 100 today, which would make it the highest close in the history of the index. And it's on an absolute tear. Just today, you've got these mega companies. They're flying, like Glencore's up 5% today. Um, you've got yeah, all I was the... Reading, I was reading about Glencore specifically. As much as... Uh, crude iron ore base precious metals everything when I mean, we've talked about gold a lot rallying and a lot of those companies you mentioned those miners are all involved in those businesses yeah as is glencore being one of the world's biggest commodity traders but i was reading a snippet about zinc prices on a supply squeeze and if you look at the zinc chart right you've got a bit of a hockey stick going on right so and just add that to the list right of yeah of commodity market spikes that we've been seeing so this is why the foot and the thing about the FTSE 100 as an index, when you look at its composition, it's got a huge portion of the of, of the index is made up of these like miners. And when you um, when you look at the actual stats, then the sector weightings within the FTSE 100. Let me just get it here. The the biggest ones, are the biggest sector. Well, actually, the biggest sector is healthcare, which clocks in at thirteen point three three. So your GSKs and your AstraZenecas are in this index, of course. Um, then it's energy, 12.75%. Uh, then it is industrial goods and services, uh, and that, uh, which is at 12%, and then banks are at 10.4%. Um, the, 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 the notable, well, so the FTSE's made a new all-time high, right? And it's above 8,000. But, I mean, should we be getting excited about this? I mean, basically, the FTSE in the year 1999 hit 7,000. In 1999, 25 years ago, it hit 7,000. Here we are 25 years later, and now we're hitting 8,000. When you kind of compare that to the S&P over the last 25 years, so the S&P 25 years ago was trading at, let's be generous, and rounded up to 1,500. It's now trading above 5,000, right? So yes, the FTSE's new all-time highs here, but it's so far behind the big giant, big brother S&P 500. Yeah, I was just and having a look. Um, and here's a, okay, a bit of a quiz for you. What was the, give me a couple, not all. What was the top 10 S&P market index weightings in 1999 then as a, as a comparison? 99, what, the set, which, which were the biggest sectors? Which were the biggest companies? Our biggest companies, uh, Microsoft. Yeah, so Microsoft, still number one. Yeah. 
no other Mac, none of the Mac Seven other than Microsoft. Were right. Already... So, to, so to your point as well of yeah. the FTSE probably looks identical to some, a large extent. Right. So Whereas X, this list looks yeah. completely different. Exxon Mobil, Exxon were sixth. What about the banks? Like this. probably J, no, JP. No in? banks. No banks. You've got okay. to just think. Think a little bit more old school. Coca Cola. A little bit more Buffett. Coca Cola. Coca Cola's in there. Yeah. Coca Cola's number seven. Cisco. Uh, no. Um, Probably rising at that point. Ooh. Give, give me one more. Okay. What's, like what's a, a big, a big, a big, uh, big brand name American in the nineties? Nike. No, more energy. Go on. GE. Ah. GE were second. Oh, General Electric. Yeah. Yeah, and then you've got the likes of IBM. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All those kind of companies. So yeah, the point being is that yeah, you're right. Now it's it is. It's uh, Alphabet, Google, Apple, right. Microsoft. Well, <laughs> the best way to, to to explain why the FTSE's lagged the S&P for the last 25 years is to look singularly at the technology sector weighting. So when you look at the S&P 500 today, 30% technology. If you look at the FTSE 100 today, and we just looked... <laughs> I brought this list up just before we started this podcast. I literally couldn't believe it. I mean, I knew that the FTSE 100 didn't have much tech, but its sector weighting is less than 1%. So versus the S&P's 30. Um, when, and that's what's gone up for the last couple of decades, technology. So, and, and to connect then our show with Stephen's deal room, like when you have an ARM IPO and they're looking for where to list... Right. Why on earth would they list in London? Yeah. On that basis, it makes zero sense for them. Yeah, absolutely. So, but look, let 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 the FTSE bask in the glory <laughs> of a new all-time high. And and as I say, what what a day cuz like Royal Dutch Shell's up 2.3%, uh BP they're up 3%, R Rio Tinto up 3, Glencore up 4. You've got Anglo America up for it's it's just phenomenal stuff, um, and so yeah, sterling weakness off the back of a hawkish hop inflation print from the U.S. coupled with commodity price spikes and nice favorable conditions for banks because the financial sector in the FTSE 100 is large. All that wrapped up, finally we got a perfect storm, and and the, the hopefully. We're going to get a close above 8,000. I say that literally as we've been talking, it's just dumped from 8,030 <laughs> down to 8,005. Oh, we've jinxed it. We are on the way south, <laughs> people. Just just a final question before we move to a, a quick look at the earnings then. So yeah. if you were managing a portfolio of long equity, so I equity stocks only, and you're buying in a sense of you're not into profit for markets going down. It's just you're buying or the prospect of things appreciating in price. What's yeah. the ge what's the kind of cyclical nature then and the geographic exposure where you would try and utilize this difference in behavior yeah. between how the FTSE is and how the S P and then others might Yeah, behave. if you want a nice there's a word in investment. That's an important one. It's called diversification. So you should always have a diversified portfolio. So, yeah, there's no use. Well, I mean, you could have put stuck all your money in NVIDIA 12 months ago, and now you'd have retired. You're saying um, my Mag 7 pension <laughs> fund is not going to serve me well. But I'm, I'm just saying that that's super high risk. And when you're right, it's amazing. It's just that sometimes we're not always right. And so when you're not right, it's definitely not amazing and, and you're overexposed, right? So the theory is spread your risk. And so you can have different sort of exposures to, to hedge off, you know, risk. And so the FTSE 100 is always considered as a defensive play. So defensive index um, because it's full of these miners and these oil companies and, and these banks and, and certainly the miners and the oil companies, big 
um, dividend payers. So that it's a great income based um, index. And so it's safe. And so that's a good reason to own it. Um, it sure, it's not going to be fireworks. You're not going to generate rapid capital appreciation, but that's fine. You can then park some of your money somewhere else, like the NASDAQ 100, for example, where, right, then you're saying, okay, I want a portion of my portfolio that is exposed to that rapid technology explosion um, and recognizing that that's high risk, though. You know, and if the Fed stay hawkish for much longer, then you might find the Nasdaqs of this world get, you know, sharp, sharp correction lower. And that's where then you're really thankful that you've got some of your money parked in the FTSE where it, that might go down as well, but at a much slower rate. And so, yeah, the FTSE is always a great, it's a great global, global exposure, you know, defensive index. Cool. Oh, makes sense. All right, then. So let's talk about some of these earnings. So the ones I want to talk about are JP, City, and, and BlackRock. So perhaps we could start with JP Morgan. Yeah. And actually, just before we delve into the single stocks, I noticed something. I was looking at the S&P 500 chart. And as we were just kind of saying, whilst it hasn't really gone down particularly since this hot inflation reading, the, uh, the S&P hasn't made a new high now for like a couple of weeks. And actually, it's kind of been sideways for a month now, okay? So it seems to have flattened off on this uptrend it's been on. The last time we were sideways for a month was actually mid-December through to mid-January. So that's the, that's the one month before the earnings season starts. So what happened mid-December through to mid-January, the S&P's flat. We started to get Q1, uh, sorry, quarter four earnings, and these earnings started to, to look really good. And the earnings then powered the next up leg on the index rally. So here we are again. The month in the lead in to the earnings season, the S&P has been flat. And now it's like, right, what are these earnings going to look like? And really, that's going to now determine where this index goes over the next potentially few months. Um, because we need strong earnings to offset this hawkish headwind because of the higher inflation. So these this earnings season is really, really key, I think, for this overall index and where it goes for the rest of the year. So, but given the robustness and resilience we're seeing on a macro level, should that translate into yeah. this earnings season being generally solid? It should do, yeah. It should. We should see good a good earnings season. I guess. What do these companies think about rates higher for longer, and which companies are more sensitive to that? Because they're the ones that are going to really start to get a sweat on that the Fed aren't going to hike till the end of the year, um, and so higher for longer in the end might tip the balance. And so we're going to look for fine. Looking in the rearview mirror, these companies have probably performed well. But what's their read now on their forecast for the year ahead? And I think that's going to be quite key. Okay, um, so that leads us in then to J yeah. JP. What did they have to say about the future then? Well, so, I mean, the, you said JP Morgan share price is down 3%. It's really for that specific reason. Their numbers are, are actually great. Um, it's just that they said, looking ahead, they're basically, for, for a bank, remember, as a quick reminder, one of the key kind of metrics on their performance is something called their net interest income, which is overall how much money are they making from, um, you, you know, lending, their lending book. So they're lending money out and they're charging an interest rate. And that interest rate is now high because the Fed's interest rate is high. Um, but that money they're lending out, where are they getting it from? They're getting it from their depositors. So people who put their money in their bank account. And so the bank is paying the depositors at small interest rate. And then they're lending that money out at a much higher rate. And that difference, the differential there, really determines their net interest income. And because interest rates have gone up, this is perfect for banks. They're able to exploit the gap between the lending and the savings rate. Okay. Um, at the moment, you well, J, basically, Jamie Dimon has been saying that we're, we're pretty much absolute peak. It, conditions could not possibly be better 
for us as a bank with regards to our net interest income because interest rates have gone up super fast from the Fed, that is, and banks tend to be very slow at increasing the rates that they pay to their depositors. They're very quick at increasing the rates they pay to the people that they're lending to. But that 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 gap can't last for long. And ultimately, there's two headwinds in the future that Jamie Dimon's saying is going to result in our net interest income dropping. And that's what he's basically saying. Last year in 2023, the bank made $90 billion in net interest income. This year, he's forecasting $89 billion. So that, that is a drop. And he's saying that two reasons. Yes, the Fed are going to cut maybe. I mean, it's it, it's so good for banks. The, the more the cut gets delayed, the better it is for banks, right? But Jamie Dimon is saying probably they're still going to cut anyway at some point. So that would then um, reduce the spread between the deposit rate and the lending rate. Bad news for banks. And then secondly, uh, depositors are being a bit more savvy now. They understand and realize, hang on a minute, why is my bank paying me such a ridiculously low interest rate in my deposit account? That's crazy. I'm going to take my money out and I'm going to find, I'm going to find an account or a whatever, uh, a money market scheme that I can put my money in and earn 5% rather than getting paid like 1% in my bank account. So you're seeing people starting to actually now get around to it's personal admin, isn't it? Who's got time to mess about changing bank accounts? That's the problem. But I think the difference is so extreme now that people are going, hang on a minute, mm. it's time to act. So that's why their share price is down. They're still forecasting a decline in net interest income this year compared to last year. So that was disappointing. Markets didn't want to hear that. Yeah. Um, but outside of that, it's the rest of it is all amazing news. Um, and actually, if we look at, because all the banks have reported together, okay, so the banks, the big four of like JP Morgan, um, Citi, Wells Fargo, and Bank of America, all the big four US banks, they've all reported together. And what's quite interesting is actually, look, they've all had a good quarter from a net interest income point of view, except JP Morgan has smashed them all. I mean, their net interest income is up 34% year over year. Wells Fargo, 16.5% rise. City, 13% rise. Bank of America, only 8.5% rise. So JP Morgan have smashed them. Why? Well, actually, First Republic. Because what these year-on-year -year comps, it's still, like if you go one year back, JP Morgan hadn't bought First Republic yet. And so that's greatly increased their, their kind of deposit base in their loan book. And so actually that's one of the reasons why JP Morgan are getting this stellar growth rate. However, I would say even before First Republic, JP Morgan were starting to stretch out their lead anyway. It's just this First Republic thing has just really catapulted them um, ahead. Um, so, look, their numbers are great. I mean, overall, their profits were up 6% with net income at $13.4 billion. Um, you know, it's 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 good news. And the longer the Fed waits to cut, basically, the better. It feels like some sensible management forward guidance. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. And Jamie Dimon, look, I've got a quote here. He said, Many economic indicators continue to be favorable. However, looking ahead, we remain alert to a number of significant uncertain forces. Um, and he pointed to an unsettling global landscape and a large number of persistent inflationary pressures, which may likely continue. That was his comment on the earnings call. Um, but he's been banging the drum of rates staying higher for longer, for a long time. You could say that's kind of talking his book. Uh, a little bit but yeah i like i like that uh ceo management it's like your business is booming and thriving and then you just continually talk pessimistic yeah just to keep the street bar significantly placed on the low side of yep. expectations so it's all just yeah uh yeah good ma good management technique i guess well he's been at the helm for you know, it's coming up nearly, I think it's 18 years he's been CEO of JP Morgan. 
that it's like it's like Alex Ferguson, right? I mean, they've got a succession problem, JP Morgan. And he's now I, I think the word on the street is that he's going to try and get to 20 years and then check out. Mm. So he's got a couple of years left. Who takes over? And that, that'll be the big risk for JP Morgan and JP Morgan's stock and share price. Not not yet, but I'm just saying in the months ahead, people are going to start to look at that a little more closely and we'll start to really drill in and scrutinize who he's lining up to succeed him and right. Are they any good? Okay. So so one thing we, we talked about here and at the beginning was you mentioned the consumer with spending. Um, and we're here I was talking about confidence in the global economy at the moment from a US consumer point of view. So credit cards I saw at City, credit card drove credit cards drove growth in its US personal banking division, boosted by more spending as well as larger interest generating balances on cards from partnerships. So do people like you on a macro level, do you look at some of these bank earnings, not for the stock in itself, right. but for signals to supplement then the traditional economic data sets like inflation and growth and ISM you mentioned and so mm. on? Yeah, absolutely. And it's a very good point. And, you know, ultimately, What's the best measure of consumption? Well, it's it's like right at the the point where the money's changing hands, right? And so that's payments, and so the big payment services that these banks provide, the data they're sat on is yeah, I mean, hugely valuable. Um, and yeah, it's these kind of figures the way you step back and you go, wow, yeah, I mean, this consumer's still really um, confident, so they're spending healthy amounts and are happy to take on debt on their credit card even though interest rates are high um, at the moment it doesn't seem to be deterring them and so yeah that just feeds back into that problem with inflation and it's just not coming down and it may not come down and so yeah the further we go through the year the less likely we're going to get any cuts at all okay so finally black rock yep so a little bit of a different side of things here. So not not a bank per se, but an asset manager. So what is it that that draws your eye when you look at something like BlackRock? Well, the headline, of course, is the AUM, the assets under management, hit a record high, ten point five trillion. That's what grabs the headlines. It's not particular. That's not a surprise in any way. Um, their assets under management. Well, what how what are they doing with this money? Well, they've invested it, a lot of it in stocks. And what stocks done? Well, they've gone up. So, okay, well, great. Their portfolio value has gone up. And so that's not particularly surprising, although it's notable and, and well done. BlackRock and obviously great for them in terms of revenues and profits. And so, yeah, I mean, good news for them, but it's really more a function of global markets and where they've gone. But underneath that, so there were other stuff. It was interesting to get a bit more info on this Bitcoin ETF, actually, which they launched, remember, back at the start, back in January. So we've, um, you know, we've almost got a full quarter of stats here. And we now know that the inflows, so we look at inflows is perhaps a better measure for an asset management firm rather than just straight out their assets under management because inflows is new money coming in. So their sales and distribution teams and their marketing engine are out there trying to attract new clients. Okay, so this is inflows. If nets, you've got money flowing in uh, with the Bitcoin ETF, or sorry, yeah, spot um, exchange traded fund, I should call it, that, ha that it reached $10 billion in record time so it's never had a product that's had 10 billion of inflows so quickly. And right now, as at the end of March, um, they've got 18.7 billion um, inflows into that Bitcoin exchange traded fund. Um, but net overall, their total inflows um, into ETFs for the quarter was 67 billion. So that's a bit more of an interesting measure as to how the, the business has been um, performing. Um they had an 11 and then outside of their sort of 
uh, you know, assets under management? What, what else are they doing to try and sort of diversify? And we always look at their technology side and their technology revenues um, were up to 37 billion, um, sorry, were up 37 billion year on year to 377 billion. Um, so that was also a very positive uh, figure. So their share price is up, yeah, what, 3%? Um, so happy days for Larry Fink. Okay, so to, to wrap it up then, um, we'll finish with a little little test for you. Ooh, go on. And uh, the people listening can play along. All right. So what I'm looking at here is that a supplement sheet that came out with their earnings, and it's like a graphical PowerPoint. And okay. on there um, is a, a kind of bar chart showing how diversified a business they have across clients, products and geographies so okay first question then you talked about the aum hitting 10.5 trillion yeah what percentage of the aum do you think is america's it's a good question uh I, i'm gonna go Gonna go at least half, I'd probably say. I'm gonna, gonna, gonna go. Be, be be bold, be brave. I'm gonna go sixty five percent. Correct answer is sixty eight percent. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you're pretty good. I'm gonna give you three then, because okay. you know, just to <laughs> see whether there's consistency behind that incredibly close guesstimate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so why don't we go to pro product type? So again, looking at the AUM, yeah. Um, equity. So, what portion of the AUM is in equities? Well, okay, that's interesting. There has been a switch out of equities as interest rates have gone up, and so people switching to like fixed income products, money market products. But you're still going to get the vast. I'd say the it's definitely majority. I'm going to say. So in percentage terms, again, I'm, I'm going to say I'm going to go higher. 80%. Oh. 54%. Uh, okay. So it's equity, 54%. Fixed income, 27%. I wonder how much that's swung yeah, I'm in sure the last sort of six months. Pack to pack. All right, fine. final one. Yeah. Um, so you talked a little bit there about ETFs. So in terms of client type, yeah, in a division of AUM between institutional, retail, and ETF, what portion or percentage portion do you think is ETFs? Um, that's interesting. So what is ETFs? That's that's neither retail nor institutional. So I mean, interesting. They split that out separately. Uh, I I'm gonna it's just a product, isn't it? Like, yeah, it's all right. It's I'd say majority. So I'm again. I'm gonna go. Gonna go sixty percent. Thirty-six. Ah, oh, what miles? Institu on. Institutional fifty-five, retail nine percent. Ah, retail's only nine. Wow, that's yeah, that's interesting. Okay, uh, ETF thirty-six. So, All right. so so maybe I should have entered. entered yeah, you yeah, should have ended that quiz after question one. Yeah, we can, let's edit I'll, I'll this edit. out. We'll edit this bit out. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Pierce, well done. You got that Thank absolutely you. spot on. Smashed it. You're a genius. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Well, that wraps it up. I uh, wish everyone a, a lovely weekend. I know certainly here in, in London, it's the sun is shining. Uh, the footsies at record highs. I feel like the flip flops and shorts are coming out. We might as well get the barbecue out. Let's go, <laughs> Royal Britannia. Let's do it. So thanks Have for listening. Week. Have and a great yeah. weekend. Yeah, see you next week.